Hi, good morning, Atibat. Hi, good morning to you all. Hi. Morning, everyone, and good afternoon and good evening. Yeah, so um, it is time uh, for the lecture. And so without further ado, um, and I don't think we need any more introduction because we already know Atipat. So uh, with that, I will uh, pass it to you, Atipat. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Okay, so yep. let me share my screen. Okay. Um, okay. So let's start. Okay. So uh, today, what uh, um, I got, we are going to study is on what we call ominimality. Ominimality. Okay. Okay. So what is, uh, we have already talked a little bit about ominimality in, I think in the previous two, le le two lectures. Um, okay, so let me be more precise and what do I mean by ominimality? Okay, so let's look at the settings that we're going to use throughout uh, today's lecture. Okay, so first we're going to have a uh, dense linear order without endpoint, and I'm going to denote, going to denote it by uh, M and less than. And here, um, since we are going to use, usually we use less than or equal to, right? But uh, this is equivalent to consider this one in state uh, because we're going to use this more often in this setting. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see what do we have here. Uh, here, uh, we're going to let this M be an expansion of, uh, of these dense linear order without endpoints. Okay. And for an in open intervals, uh, we mean that it is a set of, that is of the one of the following form. It is of the form AB for some AB that is in M and A is less than B. So here it is a set of T in M such that A is less than, uh, T is greater than A, but less than B, okay? So it behaves like uh, an open interval in the reals, but uh, it is different because we are not working uh, over the real, we're working in a more general setting, okay? And we have this, uh, intervals, open intervals, A to infinity, which is a set of T in M such that T is greater than A, okay? For some A that is uh, in M, and you have minus infinity to B, uh, which is a set of T in M such that T is less than B, uh, where B is in M, okay? So uh, it's an open, it's an open interval where you know where is the either the left or the right endpoint, right? But the endpoint is not included. Okay, so that's uh, the open intervals that in, in these contexts. Okay, and we're going to say that an expansion of a structure M is O minimal if every unary definable set is a finite union of points and open intervals, and by points, I mean set of singletons. Okay, by a point is a set of singleton. Okay, and it's turned out that uh, we can show that uh, when we have the real, uh, the real order field, this guy is O minimal, and we can show that the real, the real field with exponential function is also O minimal. <clears throat> okay, so there are some concrete uh, structure that satisfy this property. Okay, so uh, before we go to that one, so let me just roughly draw the pictures of definable sets, unary definable set in here. So it's gonna look like intervals, right? 
it's like finite union of intervals. So it can be something like this, and you can have this joint uh, uh, a point in here, or you can have close interval in here because you can regard close interval as uh, an open interval and two points. So like this. this is something that you can have in your uh, in your it, it, as your definable sets. Okay, so they're gonna look something like this. Okay, now why do we uh, interested in this one? Uh, these structures they per se uh, a lot of nice uh, properties, and the first one that I would like to introduce you is what we call uh, monogenicity theorem. Okay, so let I be an open interval and a b is in m or it can be minus infinity and plus infinity right and we're going to denote this guy by an infinity this whole thing here okay uh here we're going to uh only consider the intervals that uh a is less than b okay mm, and here if we have a function that is definable in here, uh, which is, um, sorry, if you have a function f from i to m that is definable, then we can show the following. We can show that uh, you can partition these intervals i into finitely many uh, into finitely many sets. So here you have an interval i. So let me draw a picture. So you have a, a graph of function that is definable. Something like this. Okay, and here. What you can have here is, oh, this is open. What you can have here is you can find a partition on the domain so that on each part here, I need to subdivide a little bit more. You can find a partition on the domain so that on each of these uh, set in this interval, the restriction of your function to this interval is either constant or continuous and strictly monotone. Okay, so that's what we have. Here from this picture, you can see that if I divide it into this interval and then this point, these intervals and then this and then this and then this point and then this interval you can see that on each of these intervals your restriction of your function is continuous and monotone okay so that's uh, what monotonicity theorem uh, say and in order to prove monotonicity theorem uh, we need this uh, three lemma, we, we're going, we can use this three lemmas. So the first one say that if you have a sub, if you have a function uh, from I to M that is definable, then you can find a sub interval of I on which uh, F is continuous or injective. And if F is injective on that interval, you can show that F is strictly monotone on, on a sub interval. Mm -hmm. So you can trim it further and get a, a, a sub interval that is strictly monotone. And if F is strictly monotone, you can show that uh, there is a sub interval that is uh, such that F is continuous on that sub interval. Okay. Uh, let's, let's, trying to sketch the proof of this one, sketch the proof, sketch. 
Okay, uh, let's see what do we have here. Let's suppose we have, uh, suppose uh, we have lemma one, two and three for now. Okay, so what we can do here is we can let uh, x c. Uh, I can define this set x c, which is the set of x in uh, x such that or oh, in M mm, such that uh, there exists. Mm, point uh, C and D in M such that uh, C is less than X and less than D, X is less than D and F is constant on these intervals C, D. Okay, so basically what do we mean by this is it's a set of point X such that, oh, and C, D is a subset of R. Uh, here uh, is the set of point in I such that F is locally. So what does this one mean? It's mean that F is locally mm, constant in here. Okay. And now you can uh, look at the next one. X plus is a set of X in M such that uh, X is locally strictly increasing. There exists C and D in M such that uh, C is less than X and less than D and F is strictly increasing. and continuous on CD, which is a subset of I. Mm -hmm. And X minus is a set of X in M such that uh, there exists C and D in M such that C is less than X and less than D and F is strictly decreasing. And continuous on CD in I. Okay, uh, so it's mean that uh, this one is the set of X, uh, point X that is uh, such that F is locally strictly increasing on and continuous about uh, that point. And for X minus, it is set of a point X such that F is strictly decreasing and continuous about that point. Okay, uh, here you can see that uh, the word uh, D set, observe that uh, these sets are continuous. Oh, if these x, c, x plus, and x minus are continuous. Oh, and I think I forgot to tell you what do I equip. We equip uh, well, what do you mean by yeah. Continuous. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I forgot to, to talk about the topology on MN. So let me uh, by the topology. Connected by or continuous? Continuous. Continuous. Oh, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, are definable, sorry. And why, why is that? Uh, that is because when you look at uh, MN, we can equip MN by uh, a topology that is uh, 
generated by uh, by uh, open boxes. Uh, what do we mean by open boxes? It's just an intervals, A, I, B, I times blah, 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 up to A, N, B, N. Okay, so here is uh, the pot topology that we equip with M to the N. And then we can represent uh, the continuity of F. We say that F is continuous f from m from x which is a subset of m to the n to m to the m uh, is continuous if uh, for every box uh, J, that is a subset of uh, M to the M, right? And for every Y that is in J, Okay, so basically we just say that this is the open, this J is an open neighborhood of Y. Okay. You can find the axis and open box um, I, such that that is a subset of X. such that uh, there exists, uh, oh, 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 okay. So let me just rewrite this a little bit. For every J that is in here, uh, and for every, X that is in, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, there exists uh, an open box and a, a box. I, that is a subset of X such that for every X, that is in I, f of x is in j. Or roughly speaking, it means that uh, the pre-image of j is open. Mm -hmm. There exists a box for a point uh, I think I I wrote down the order this order wrong but let me fix myself uh, for every X that is in uh, are you going to prove uh, the continuity? Is it definable? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so here, but I think it is trivial because the continuity uh, of the function mm -hmm. is uh, the function is continuous at each point, and the right. uh, the property mm -hmm. that uh, the point at uh, x the function is continuous is of course definable. So the continuity right. is definable. Uh huh. So I, I trying to uh, give an idea of how we can construct uh, the formulas. So I, but I think I miss, I swap the order of quantifiers a little bit. So I just want to say that for every x that is in here, with uh, f x that is in j, right? 
uh, there exists um, a box i about x such that uh, i is a subset of x and f of i is a subset of j. Mm -hmm. So that's how we can construct the, the formulas for this one because each box can be represented by using just order, right? Because if you have something that is in a box, it's mean that it must satisfy these inequalities. AI less than uh, XI less than BI. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's uh, roughly what I would like to say for every box in here and for every point. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And okay. And now that we have that these are definable, then we're going to get that uh, XC x plus and then x minus are uh, open as well by the definition. Okay, and so, and so uh, you get that xc, x minus and x plus are finite unions of open interval. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now that uh, we have xc, x plus and x minus are, are open, a finite union of open intervals, uh, we can see that uh, it is enough to show that <clears throat> it is enough to work on each interval separately, right? Because we want to show that uh, we 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 can have a we can partition it into sub intervals. So that's up each sub interval when you restrict your function to, to that uh, interval, it is constant or strictly increasing and continuous or strictly decreasing and continuous. So we can work on each of these uh, separately. Okay. Oh, okay. So with, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Oh, but before we can uh, do that, uh, there is something that is uh, that we still missing. That is what about the complement of this guy, right? So here you already know that uh, if you can work on each one of these separately, you can see that, uh, okay, so you can see that if you can work on these ones separately, you still have a problem, which is the complement of this guy. So first let's take care of that guy. Consider mm, if, okay, it is enough to work on this separately if, this guy is finite. So let me put it this way. And how do we get that? Here you can see that if suppose uh, I minus XC union X plus and union X minus is not finite, right? Uh, then by uh, O minimality, Mm. There exists uh, an interval J
that is a subset of i minus xc union x plus union x minus. Okay. And now by using lemma one, lemma two, and lemma three, we uh, obtain contradiction. Why is that? Uh, because if uh, this guy has a, an interval here, it must contain a sub interval that is either constant or injective. And if it's injective, if it's constant, then it must be a subset of XC. If it is injective, you can subdivide it into uh, and sub intervals that is either strictly increasing and continuous or strictly increasing and decreasing and continuous. So it must be in here, right? So either case, you get a contradiction. So you know that uh, these cannot happen. Therefore, you get that I minus XC union X plus union X minus is finite. Okay, now let's see what do we have. So as we already discussed, so we, with our loss of generality, we may now assume that uh, I is equal to X of C, or I is equal to X plus, or I is equal to X minus. So it must be one of the following case. Okay, now let's look at case one. Assume uh, I is equal to XC. Okay, then what can we do here? If uh, you have an interval I and it is locally constant on that uh, interval, right? You're going to have that if you pick any X zero that uh, is in I, and then you can set Y zero to be equal to F of X zero. Okay. And what you would like to do here is you want to say that uh, your function F must be equal to Y zero for every point that is in uh, your, do your domain I. Okay, so how can we show that? So let S be equal to the supremum of the set of X that is in I. And we gonna let FX, uh, sorry, FT is equal to F of uh, equal to Y zero for every T that is in X zero to X. Open here. Okay. So what we going to say is, what we would like to do is we going to look at this interval I, this is your interval I, and you pick an X zero, and what we would like to do is we would like to uh, trying to reach as, as far as possible. So I trying to reach as far as possible. So that uh, on this part, it's still a constant, right? F on this part, gonna send it to Y zero. So Y zero is constant on this part. Okay, so I'm trying to reach as far as possible. And if I get that S is equal to B, so I'm gonna get that it is constant on here. Okay, so now let's see. Okay, if S is not equal to B, then let's see what's going to happen. Then you're gonna get that uh, if S is not equal to Y zero, because if fs is equal to y0 and s is in xc, 
you must you should be able to find a local neighborhood of this s right so you're going to have something on the right of s so that's who make that s is not a supremum okay so here if fs is equal to y0 then you're going to get that f s is not equal to y0 but uh, that still cannot happen because if you look at this image of x of s, this is just a singleton y0, right? Uh, which means that if you have fs is not, e is not equal to y0, you cannot reach from s to the right and it's still constant. Uh, these contradict the fact that S is in X, C. So that's how we get that uh, uh, S must be equal to B, then S must be equal to B. Okay. Um, okay. Similarly, you will get that A is equal to the sub, oh, sorry, the inf of set of x in i such that f of t is equal to y0 by a similar argument. But this time, we're going to look at the right of this interval. Okay, so here uh, we have this as well. Then you're gonna get that uh, xc is equal to this interval i, right? And therefore, f is constant on i. Okay. So that's the first case. Hmm. Next, uh, we can consider when i is equal to x plus. OK, so you can uh, do something that is similar to what we previously do. So here we can take x0 be a point that is in i. Okay, and I'm gonna set S to be equal to the supremum. Of the set of X that is in I such that F is increasing is strictly increasing. Strictly increasing. and continuous on x0 to x. Okay, so now let's consider the sky. Um, by our similar argument uh, as the above, right? So we can show that, so suppose, S is not equal to B, right? <clears throat> Here, since we have that uh, X, uh, S is in X plus, right? Since X is in X, X plus, so then there exists A neighborhood uh, about S such that uh, uh, there this is a neighborhood uh, J about S such that F is continuous and strictly 
increasing on J. Okay, and now that we have that uh, S is continuous and trickery increasing on J, since you know that uh, F is also continuous and strictly increasing on x0 to s, right? So we get that s is not a, <clears throat> uh, okay. So we get that s is, mm, f is, uh, continuous and strictly increasing on J union, uh, let me put it in order, X zero S union J. Okay, so the J is on the right of X zero and S, X zero to S. Okay, so here, uh, which is absurd, because that's going to contradict the, the, um, the fact that S is a supremum, which is absurd. Okay, so now you get that S is equal to B. Okay, you can do uh, or by using a similar argument. You can have that uh, S, sorry, A is, of, is equal to the infimum of the set of X that is in I such that F is strictly increasing and continuous on x to x0. Okay, so uh, you can do this. Mm -hmm. So in this case, hence, you're going to get that x plus is equal to your set i. Okay, so which means that if you restrict your function to these x, to these interval, you're gonna get that it's strictly increasing and continuous. And then you can consider the last case, but the last case gonna be similar by or similar argument as in case two, we are done. Okay, and you can use an argument that is similar to case uh, two to, to show this. So this is, please complete this proof. Okay, so that's how we uh, roughly prove uh, this monotonic D theorem. Um, we still haven't seen the, the proof of lemma one and lemma two and lemma three yet, but let me roughly show you the proof of lemma one instead, just, just lemma one, just to give you an idea of some technique that we can use. Okay, uh, so for lemma one, let me recall you what we need here. So we want, we want to show that there exists a sub interval of I such that uh, F is on which on which F 
is continuous or injective. Okay, so now how can we prove that? Uh, we can prove this by uh, contradiction. Suppose uh, there is no in sub interval of I on which F is uh, constant is con oh this is constant not continuous is constant here okay so you can uh, ac actually we not gonna prove it by contradiction we suppose that there is uh, no sub interval i of i on which f is constant con con is constant and then we will show that we will sure that uh, there is a sub interval of i on which f is injective okay so now let's see what can we do here? Uh, here, since we have that uh, f cannot be a constant on any sub interval, then we're going to have that uh, for every y0 that is in M, we're going to have that the pre image of this point y0 must be finite because if it's not finite then it must contain an open interval and then f will be constant on that interval okay so here it must be finite so you know that each of these pre-image are finite then you're going to get that since this is finite, then you're going to get that if you look at uh, the image of I, this must be infinite. Right. <clears throat> okay, because these there are infinitely many points in I, and when you map it, you, you get that this must be infinite as well because the, the, you, you cannot map to only finally many points. Um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so uh, it must contain, contain uh, an open interval. And let me call J. Okay, the image of I must contain an interval J. Okay, now let's see how can we uh, get uh, the sub interval of I. So what we can do is we can define a function G from FI to I, uh, from J. So it's open J to I by, okay, we going to let G be a set a function that is defined by GY is equal to minimum of the pre-image of Y. So here you know that uh, this pre-image is finite. Then you can take the minimum of this guy. And since there are only ma finitely many of them, <clears throat> uh, and yes, and you can always choose the minimum and this function is definable. 
observe that. G is definable and is also injective. Okay, so here by ch choosing the minimum of this, you can get that it is definable and injective because it, we choose it from f, where f is a function. Okay, so since this is uh, definable and injective, you can get that, and since your j is infinite, you can get that the image of j, g of j under g is also infinite. Mm -hmm. And then uh, g j must contain an interval. And we're going to call it i prime. And we know that this i prime must be a subset of i. Ooh. And now that uh, we know that gj is uh, j i prime is a subset of i, and we can notice that if you look at on these interval i, then you can get that when you look at f restrict on i prime, these f i prime is injective. The restriction of f to i prime is injective. Okay, so that's how we uh, get this sub interval. Okay, and basic, uh, you can roughly see that the g here is an inverse of this guy in this interval. <laughs> okay, so that's what uh, we have here. Okay, now we can also show lemma two and lemma three, but uh, we're gonna uh, leave that for now so we can uh, talk about something else. Okay, so here we, uh, the other interesting, uh, sorry, other, in let me introduce you another interesting properties of uh, O minimal structure. Here you can have that if uh, you have a set A that is a subset of M square and be definable. And for each X that is in M, if you have a, if you know that each fiber of A over X, which is the set of Y in M such that X, Y is in A is finite, then you're gonna get that there must be a uniform bound on the number of, uh, of, of elements in AX, that must be a uniform bound on the numbers AX. Okay, so what do we have here is if you have something like you have this, you can consider this graph, this is your set A, you can have something that is look like this, and you can see that on each part, you have only finitely many points. When you project each point above here to the y-axis, you have only finitely many points. This is the condition that we have in here. Okay, uh, usually when we have a set that is definable in some structure, uh, it's not necessarily that if it's uh, finite, then it must define that then there must be a uniform bound on the number of, of points in here. You can just roughly imagine that you can have a, a set that look like this, right? This is zero, this is one, this is two, and so on. You can draw something like this. You can see that at each fiber, it is finite, but there is no uniform bow on here. Um, but this set will not be definable in our structure, in our minimal structure here. 
Okay, now let's uh, me uh, roughly uh, let me tell you how to how to get this finiteness uh, lemma. Okay, so what we can do here is sketch a proof. So first we can let uh, a for for a b that is in m square. Uh, we say that a b is normal with respect to this set a if uh, there exists a box i times j such that uh, either intersect is disjoint from a or you have that uh, AB is in your set A and uh, I times J intersect A is equal to the graph of F for some mm, continuous uh, function F from I to M. Okay, so uh, this is what uh, we mean by uh, normal. So let me show you the picture of what we have here. Uh, here you have a set A. Let's say that you have something like this. Or you... <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to say that uh, a point is normal if it is, you can, let's say you can look at this point here, this white dot here. You can see that I can draw a box around this one and there's nothing that is in A that intersect with my uh, box. So we're going to call that this point is normal. Okay, or you can- so the look box I cross J contains a, B, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Uh, right, right, right. Uh, I... And there's a box about A, B. About, right, about A, B. Such that. Mm -hmm. huh. Okay, there is a box about A, B, such that it either in, uh, disjoint from the set A or it's locally look like a graph of function. So here you can consider at this point, this point, you can see that if you draw a box here, this is, a, this look like a graph of function. So this is good, but this point, this point is not good. Okay, because you can uh, you can see that on the right hand side there is nothing in here, so you 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 it doesn't look like a graph of function on the on the on your domain i no matter how small your i is, and it doesn't disjoint from your your set. But and also if you look at this point, even though it's not in a b. And, and this one is not in AB and it doesn't disjoint from your set A. So this one is not good as well. Another problem is something that look like this. You can have something that is splitting. If you have something that's splitting, uh, you can see that it cannot be a graph of function because it's not a function on the right. Like for example, in this picture, it's not a function on the right of that point. Okay, so that's uh, something that uh, we will consider not normal and normal. <clears throat> okay, now what uh, we would like to do 
in or when we think about um, uh, the finiteness uh, lemmar is, what we were trying to do is we were trying to find a point on the on the x-axis here such that uh, it has something that is not normal. Okay. Oh, actually, I haven't finished my definition of normal yet. Okay, but that, that's okay. So we want to find something that is not normal. Okay. So you can see that uh, if this one is, if you get rid of the point that is not normal, what you're going to have is you're going to get something that look like, let me oops, erase this bad part. And if we get rid of the bad part here, I get rid of it, I remove it from my domain. You can see that uh, from the example, if you get rid of that, bad part, you can see that you're going to look on each sub interval here, it's going to look like a finite stack of continuous function. And you can see that uh, it is, yeah, if you have a stack of continuous function, the number of points on each uh, fiber is going to be constant on that interval. Okay. Now, but that's not the only problem because you can find another problem that look like this as well. You can find something that is asymptotically uh, go to infinities, something like this, or go to minus infinities. So next part that I would like to introduce is what is also called a normal point, but I'm gonna consider it at uh, infinities. Okay, so for A that is in M, uh, we say that this A infinity is normal if, okay, so now what uh, I would like to say is it's not asymptotically getting close to uh, this point uh, as the, so I would like to say that the limit as X go to A, it doesn't go to infinity. Okay, so in order to get that, uh, I gonna have that A infinity is normal if there exists, mm and open interval i about a and b is in m such that when you look at this Cartesian product of a, uh, sorry, i and b, to infinity, this is empty. So it's disjoint, uh, intersect A. <laughs> okay, so you don't want a point that is behaves like this one. You don't want it. Okay, and uh, we say that A minus infinity is normal if there exists an open interval i about a such an b in m uh, such that i times minus infinity to B uh, intersect A is empty. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, 
we would like, uh, that's what we have here. And we can consider the set of what we call like bad points, B, be the set of A in M, such that uh, there exists. So this is a bad point as a subset of your X axis such that uh, B is in M infinity. Let me abuse the notation a little bit, such that uh, AB is not normal. Okay, so here we can consider this guy, the set of the bad point on the X axis, the point that uh, we don't wanna have. And let's see what we can do here. Uh, here, if we can consider this, if we have A be a point that is in M, but is not in B, then you can get that, then uh, there exists an interval I, about A such that uh, the pi inverse of A of I is a finite union of graphs of continuous function. from uh, I to M, okay. And in this case, you will get that, uh, then the cardinality of AX is, uh, oh, okay. So here you're gonna have something like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's see, what do we have here? Uh, if A is in here, then you must have something like this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now what can we do here? So here we know that this point B is the, the bad point that we don't like. So let's suppose that uh, we have only finitely many bad points. Suppose uh, B is finite. Uh, let's say that we can write B in terms of A1 up to AK. Okay, now we are gonna show that claim. Uh, the B is finite. Then we are gonna show that uh, this is constant on an interval AI to AI plus one on each of these interval where I is equal to uh, zero to K where AI, uh, oh, sorry, AI to right, right, right. Where is zero? is equal to A and A K plus one is equal to B. Mm -hmm. Okay, now how do we show this? Then to prove this, we can consider the following two sets. Consider the set of X that is in this interval A I and then AI plus one, such that the cardinality of AX is equal to N. Ah, I haven't declared what N is, I skip a little bit. So here we can pick uh, I, any point that is in here, let A be in AI, AI plus one, uh, and let 
n be equal to the cardinality of a sub a, the fiber of a over a. Now you can consider the set of point x in these intervals such that the fiber is the number of set in the fiber is n or the set of in the fiber is not equal to n. Okay. So now let's see. Mm, here uh, you can show that these two sets are open and definable and definable. So you can show that these two sets are uh, open and definable because uh, we get rid of the point uh, B that is bad, right? So what you're going to have is if you have a point A, right? You should be able, you can find an open interval for each point that is in AX such that it look like a graph here, right? And there is nothing that is look like this, or this. So you're gonna get that the, these two sets are definable. Uh, and then you can show that uh, for open intervals, it cannot be noted that an open interval cannot be written as a disjoint union of two open intervals of open sets. Uh, in this case, two non-empty open set. Two non-empty open sets. Okay, then you're gonna get that at least one of them is empty, right? But you know that the first guy is not empty, then you're gonna get that uh, absolute AX equal to N for every X that is in this interval AI to AI plus one. So now you know that uh, this is, must be constant. And then that's gonna, complete this proof because you now have only uh, k many intervals. Uh, no, actually it's k, uh, k plus one intervals, right? So you're gonna have these k plus one in intervals, k plus one many intervals. So you can choose the maximum of those number of the constant. And then you can look at each point A1 up to AK and look at the cardinality of A, uh, A over A, right? The fiber of A over A, uh, over AI. Then you're gonna get that. We can take the maximum of those finite points and then get the, the upper bound. Okay, so now we can see that this was done using the assumption that uh, B is finite. So to complete this proof, uh, it is enough to show that uh, B is actually is finite. Now we suppose that uh, B is not finite. Then what can we do here? Okay. So now what can we do here is then you can get that if B is not finite, you can have an open interval that exists and open interval J. 
that is a subset of B. Mm. Okay, now let's see, you have this. And for A, that is in J, you can let uh, beta A to be the set of the least in, in M, the least, uh, the least T in M infinity such that a T is not normal, okay? Because we are working on the, the, the bad points, right? So here you can have uh, these beta A such that uh, it is not normal, right? For every point that is in, so note that, you can get that A, beta A, is not normal for every A that is in J. Okay, so here, this is what we have. Okay, now let's see what can we do here. So let's say that uh, you have a, a beta that is a, a set of uh, bad points, right? Okay, now let's see that uh, what we can do. Uh, however, when we talk about the beta A, um, beta A is, is not necessarily, uh, oh, okay, so here we, we have this guy. Okay, now what we would like to do is we would like to do something about this guy. So here, in order to get that, I'm gonna let uh, J plus to be the set of A in J, such that there exists a Y that is greater than beta A, such that A Y is in A. Okay. And I can also have J minus, which is a set of A in J, such that there exists some Y that is less than beta A, such that A Y is in A. Okay, so what does this J plus and J minus mean? It means that uh, it's the set of point of A, such that there must be something that is in A that is above these, these least uh, bad point and j minus is there must be something that below uh, the least bad point something in a and we can define uh, beta plus or j plus to m by to be something uh, to be something that map any point a it's gonna get mapped to uh, min minimum of the set of y that is greater than beta a such that uh, a y is in a okay and i'm gonna let beta minus to be a function from j minus to max of set of y that is less than beta a such that a y is in A. Okay, and these functions are well defined because uh, each fiber is finite, right? And you have an upper bound here. Okay, and this one is, uh, let me fix my, uh, yes, this is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here, this is correct. <laughs> Okay, so now you can see that you can have this J plus and J minus. And for, for a point that is in J plus, you can consider B plus. And for a point that is in J minus, you can consider B minus. Okay, so now let's see. So here, uh, but it is possible that 
uh, this J plus or J minus can be empty. So we're going to consider on each case, consider when uh, we can consider each, uh, each case. So here, if you have uh, J plus intersect uh, J minus is not empty, or you can, um, uh, right, uh, no, uh, here, since you have that J is equal to this guy, J plus J minus intersect uh, J plus minus J minus, and union J minus minus J plus and union uh, J minus J plus union J minus. Since these four sets are definable, this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, they are definable. And J is an open interval. Then you're gonna get that that must be an open interval that is contained in one of these. Mm. Then at least one of them is infinite. Okay, and since if it's infinite, then it must contain an uh, open interval. Okay, uh, so let's see what do we have here. Okay, so now, uh, due to the times, let me just show you one case. Okay, so suppose, assume that uh, there exists an interval J prime that is contained in J plus intersect J, J minus. Okay, let's consider this case. Okay. So what you can do here is since you have J plus right now, a uh, J prime right now, which is an interval, and this interval is a sub is a subset of J plus intersect J minus, which means beta plus and beta minus are defined on this J prime. Okay. Then you can apply monotonicity, monotonicity theorem. So you can apply monotonicity theorem to the beta plus and beta minus. You can get that uh, there exists mm. J double prime, which is a subset of J prime, uh, such that on which, on which beta plus and beta minus are continuous. Right. Okay, so now you can look at this one. Okay. Next, you can consider You can consider this set, the set of X that is in I such that uh, X beta A, X beta X is in A. And you can consider the set of X in I such that uh, X beta X actually in J prime. J double prime, such that this one is not in A. Okay, so here you can have these beta X, right? That is in A, and you can have X uh, beta X that is not in A. So let's look at the picture of the first one. It's mean that if X beta X is in here, right? So you're gonna get a graph of function here. And you, you're going to get a set of point that is in A, right? It can be jump up and down. We, we don't know that yet. This is your first one. But you know that this guy is in A. And what else we can do? 
uh, we know that the sky is in A and we can have a beta plus, right? Uh, okay, so here I forgot that B, I gonna make, sorry about that. I want to make beta continuous as well. Uh, so that's what would, I need to fix myself a little bit. So here, uh, if you have beta is continuous and it's in A, so you're gonna have something that look like this, right? And uh, next you can have a beta plus that is above. You have beta minus that is below here. It's mean that on this J prime, this is your J prime. This is your J prime. You can see that if you draw this picture here and you can shrink this guy a little bit by using the continuity of beta plus and beta minus, you can draw a box about this graph of beta. So which mean that this point gonna be in your, uh, the graph of beta gonna be in your set A, right? On the other hand, if you look at uh, the other case, if beta plus beta is not in A, so this guy is not in A in this case, this is when it is in A, this is not in A. What you can have is, this is your beta plus, and this is your beta minus, you're gonna have that nothing in here is in A. Nothing in here is in A, nothing in here is in A, right? And this graph is not in A. So you're gonna get that this whole thing here is not in A, which mean that by shrinking this guy a little bit, you can draw a box that make this graph of beta disjoint from A. But that will mean that in either two cases that we have here, you're gonna get that A, beta A is normal. Okay, now what you can get here is, let's consider now to complete this proof, we can consider this guy, the set of X in J double prime, uh, then at least one of these must be must contain an interval. Then uh, at least one of these two sets contain uh, an interval. And then you can get that in either case. We uh, get a point in J prime, A, a point A in J prime, a J double prime, such that A beta A is normal and that's going to contradict what we have observed up here. Okay, so that's uh, the how uh, we can prove uh, finiteness lemma. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, finiteness lemma and a monotonicity theorem. It's uh, a theorem that talk about uh, properties of unary definable subsets of a um, an O minimal structure. But uh, O minimal structures also have a nice properties when you look at a uh, higher dimension. Okay, and the idea is we can decompose every definable set into what we call cells. So let me introduce you what uh, cells are. So for each set in X that is in M to the M, we let uh, CX to be the set of 
continuous function from x to m, continuous definable function from x to m, and c infinity x is the set of all continuous func definable continuous function on x, and we add to function which is minus infinity and infinity. This for notation purposes. Okay, where we regard these minus infinity as a continuous function, as a, a function that that sent everything to is a constant minus infinity function, and in and this infinity is a constant infinity function. Okay, and for g in for f and g in c infinity x, we will write uh, f is less than g if fx is less than gx uh, for all x that is in x. And we let uh, these open in open interval fgx to denote the set of area between two graph. So here, if you have your f is this guy, your g is this guy, the area between these two sets, this is your fgx. Okay. And now, well, now that we have this, we can talk about uh, talk about cells. Okay. Let i one up to i m be a sequence of zero and ones of length m, and i one up to i m cell is a definable subset m to the m defined uh, recursively obtained as follows. So what we going to do is we would like to consider like something that is simple and look like a, a building block for our definable sets. So when we think about the unary definable sets, you can see that you can build up uh, a definable set by using uh, open intervals and points, right? So we're going to let those two types of sets become cells in our in our context. But uh, we will try to distinguish between these two sets. So we're gonna let a uh, zero cell, let singleton to be zero cell, and we're gonna call open interval one cell. Okay, and suppose that uh, we have I1 up to I M cell, uh, we can define um, I1 up to I M zero cell to be the graph of a continuous definable function on that, on a cell, on a cell. Okay, and this is one. I1 up to I M cell is a set of this area between two function, two definable continuous function, where we allow f and g to be my in infinity and minus infinity. Okay, uh, let's to get some idea on how these cell things work. Let's just try to look at some example here. So let's look at uh, the big and uh, the first case when you have um. Only our only x axis, right? That's the base case. So here you can have points and you can have open interval here. This is zero cell. This is zero cell. Nope, I shouldn't write it like this. I should. Uh, this is zero cell. This is zero cell. This is a, an example of one cell. Okay, now what else can you do here? You can, once you move yourself from uh, M to M square, this we are in M square right now. So what we can do is we can consider a zero, zero cell. Zero, zero cell is a graph on a point, right? Because zero cell is a point. So it's a graph on a point is also a point. So here, if you have a point in here, this is zero, zero cell. 
two, three. So this is your zero, zero cell. And let's see what else you can have. Uh, what is zero one cell then? So zero one cell, you're gonna start from a point down here and you're going to have a, a function to function on continuous function on that one, on that point, but continuous function on here must be point as well. So in this case, but you don't want that point. So you're going to have something that look like this. So it's look like an interval, but it's on the y axis. So this is zero one cell. Uh, you can have one zero cell. So one zero cell, you're going to start from an open interval down here. And you're going to have a graph of continuous function. So it's going to be something that looks like this. This is zero one cell. And for one one cell, it's going to be something that look like this. This is one one cell. Okay. So this is how the cells look like in our or minimal structures. Uh, you can also look at something in uh, three dimensionals. Uh, you can have something that look like surface of continuous function. If this is the x, y, and z axis, you can think of this as one, one, zero cell. And you can have something that look like a cube in here. These can be considered as one, one, one cell, example. So that's uh, what uh, we have for the definition of self. And a nice thing about uh, O-minimal structure is uh, we can have the concept of uh, this decomposition. Uh, decomposition of M to the M is a partition of M to the M into finitely many cells, which uh, obtain recursively as follows. So we're going to start from a decomposition of the universe M, which is just uh, a partition of M into finally many cells. Okay, so you can have that, it's gonna be of this form, you have minus infinity A1, and then set of A1, and then A1, and then A2, and then set of A2, and so on, you have set of AK, and then AK to infinity, okay, where A1, up to AK, where A1 is less than A2, less than so on, up to AK. Right. And now that we have the base case, we can construct a higher dimension decomposition, uh, a decomposition on M to the M plus one is a finite partition of M to the M plus one into cells such that the set of projection of pi a is a decomposition of m to the m. Okay, so we project it down to lower, one dimension lower, we get a, 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 a decomposition. Okay, and let uh, this be a collection of fi a finite collection of sets, a1 up to ak, we say that a partition C is compatible with this set if for each C that is in this partition, it also, uh, we also have that C is a subset of AI or C is disjoint from AI. Or you can just say that it is compatible with this set if it's also a partition of each of this set. Okay, it's, you partition the whole thing and then you partition each of these sets as well. Okay, uh, now let's uh, look at uh, some example here. Here you can think about, uh, let's say you have a set that look uh, something like this.
Okay. So uh, the dim composition in R1 is in, in when n is equal to one is obvious. Now let's try to see some example in here. So we would like to partition the whole thing here into cells, right? So what we can do here is I can just cut uh, the part that is not in here. And we think of this as, oh, this is empty set. Empty set is also a, this is also a cell. Oh, no, not, 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 not empty set. Uh, the, the whole space here, this is, um, so if this is, this is A, this is B, this set is uh, minus infinity to A cross R, oh, cross N times M. And this side is B to infinity times M. So that's gonna partition this one. And then what can we do here? So what we can do here is we would like to say something like, oh, can I partition it so that on each part, it look like a cell. So here I can do something like this, right? Uh, if I partition it this way, you can see that on each piece, these guys are cells. Each piece, there are cells. However, there is a problem here because uh, you can look at this set. You can look at this set right here. If you project it down, you get this interval, right? And when you project these guy down, you get this interval. You project this guy down, get interval. So you have uh, a set that looks different. Right, so these cannot be disjoint. So this is not a partition. When you project it down, it's not a partition in this case. Uh, so to fix this, you can see that we can subdivide it further. So you can get rid of this guy when you project it down. But this will become uh, a cell decomposition while at the beginning, it is not. Okay, and it's turned out that uh, we can show that when you have a collection, finite collection of definable subsets of M to the M, M to the N, uh, there exists a decomposition of M to the N that is compatible with these finite set A1 up to AK. And you also have that uh, if you have A, be a subset of M to the N, be definable, and you have a definable function on those set A. Uh, here, let me note that I put this N here. Then there is a definable, then there is a decomposition C of M compatible with this set A, such that for each uh, cell in this decomposition, with uh, C, this is, uh, which C is a subset of A, the restriction of F to this set C is continuous. Okay, so uh, the first one say that if you have a finite collection of definable sets, right? You can find a decomposition that compatible of M to the N that is compatible with those finitely many sets that also partition those sets. Uh, for second one, you have that if A is a definable set and you have a definable function on those set, you can find a decomposition of M to the N that's compatible with this set A, such that on each cell that is in here, when you look at the restriction of these F to those cells, you're gonna get a continuous map. Okay, so that's uh, what uh, these cell decompositions say. Usually when we refer to uh, cell decomposition, you, we usually mean this one, number one and number two, right? There are two, uh, two parts of it. 
but uh, I add another one here. This one usually called our uh, uniform finiteness. Uniform finiteness. Okay. So what does this one mean? Uh, what does this one say? It say that if you have A, which is the subset of M2 plus one, M to the N plus one, be definable. And for each X that is in M to the N, if you have that the fiber of A over X, which is a set of Y that is in M, such that X, Y is in A, is finite, then you're gonna get a uniform bound. So this is not good. Uh, then there is n, that is n, such that uh, the cardinality of a is less than or equal to n. Okay, so you, if you have that each fiber is finite, then you're gonna have a uniform bound on, on the number of, on the cardinality of each fiber. Okay, so you can, when you have a set A that is a subset of M to the N plus one, another way is that you can look at it is you can think of this as a family, as a family of, 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 of sets, right? And this is how we look at it. And we say that if this family is, is finite for every point, then the, that must be a uniform bound on this one. You can see that uh, this guy is like a generalization of uh, finiteness lemma. Okay. And since we don't have much time left, so let me tell you the idea of how we are uh, going to proceed this proof. So here you can notice that if you look at I1, I1 say that if you have A, which is a collection of definable subsets of M to the N, and uh, here you, uh, of, you have a A1 up to AK, the uh, collection of subsets, right, of M. Okay. You want to find a composition, a, a decomposition of M that compatible with the sky. How can we do that? We can see that when we look at each of the sky, you can look at all of the Boolean combination of the sky and each of the Boolean combination of this guy, you can uh, see that you're gonna get it's going to be, can be each of the Boolean combination of this guy can be written as a finite union of uh, points and open intervals because they are definable, right? So, and you can look at something that can generate some disjoint set that can generate all of these sets, right? Uh, and by looking at that, you can say that that one going to generate the decomposition of M. So this is followed from definition then, from definition. Let me just put it that way. And for 2-1, uh, 2-1 going to follow uh, from monotonicity. And for three one, three one is finiteness lemma. Okay. Okay. Now that we have uh, I one up to uh, I I one I I one I I I one right, three one. Let's say um, we can get that. What what? How can we proceed next? The next idea is we're going to proceed by induction. Proceed by induction. So the idea of uh, what we're going to proceed is we're going to assume that we have I1, 2, 1, and 
and then 3, 1. And then I2 and 2, 2 and 3, 2 and so on up to up until you have I uh, M and 2M and 3M here. So we're going to assume this. And then we're going to show that, uh, we're going to show that, then we're going to have I1, oh, I M plus one, M plus one, not one. And now that we have this I M plus one, we're going to use these I M plus one and everything that come from above to show that we can have two M plus one, this guy plus the above to show two M plus one. And then we're going to take everything from the above plus I M plus one plus two M to show that we can have three M plus one. Okay, so that's the idea. And now once we have these three M plus one, you can now see that we can go to one M plus two, and then two M plus two, three M plus two, and so on. So by uh, proceeding uh, in this manner, you are gonna get the theorem, okay? Um, okay. Um, okay, so that's what I would like to roughly say about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And by, uh, and here are something that is uh, nice about uh, O minimal structure, O minimality. Uh, you can see that when we start talking about O minimality, we say that it is a property of structures. But actually, uh, O minimality also can be considered as a properties of theory. Okay, here is what we have. Let L be a language that expanding uh, language of orderings. And let's say we have M and N, the L structures, if you have M that is O minimal and M is elementary equivalent to N, then N is also O minimal, right? So it preserves under elementary equivalence. So you can say that it is a, a properties of theory as well. Okay, so now let me roughly tell you what is the idea. So here we have M that is O minimal, right? And what we would like to say is, we would like to say that every unary definable set in N is also a finite union of uh, intervals and points. So we're going to have A uh, be a unary definable set in N. Okay, so unary definable set in N. Since this is a uh, unary definable, so you can write this guy as a set of T that is in N, such that N satisfy phi and then B1 up to BN T, where B1 up to BN is in N. Okay, so now uh, what can we do next? However, there is a problem here because B1 up to Bn is in this set N, but if we only know about M, so we cannot talk about this uh, immediately when we think about uh, the other structure M. So what we can do here is we can let X be the set of A1, up to a n and then s that is in m to the n plus one uh, where m 
satisfy phi a1 up to a n s. Okay, so here instead of consider these uh these guy right here as a parameters, right? You we can just think, oh, instead of looking at as a parameters, we can think of it as a family of set with the parameters as your index set. Okay, uh, now what uh, we can do next is we can look at this for any set uh, Y, we let uh, BDY to be the set of closure of Y and then subtracted by the interior of Y. Okay, so here is what uh, the boundary of Y means. So you can show that the, the closure is definable and the interior of a set of a definable set is also definable. Then when you consider the boundary of your set X, that and for each A1 up to AN, each fiber here, you're gonna get that uh, since we subtract every open set from those set, right? These must be uh, finite for every A1 up to An that is in M to the N. Okay, so you get that this set X is now a family of uh, finite sets. So you can apply by uniform finiteness. You can get that uh, there is a uniform bound that exists and uh, show number K such that uh, the cardinality of B, D, X, A1 up to A, n is less than or equal to k for every a1 up to a n that is in m to the n okay so here you can get a uniform bound on the numbers and what else that you can see is you can see that when you want to define each of these sets you can use the boundary to define uh, to define to define your your set. You can use the point in your boundary to define your set, which means that uh, you can see that for each point for no, sorry for each uh, fiber here, you only need at most k point to define your set. So that's what you get from there. Which what does that one mean? It means that if you look at these intervals and you have point A1, A2, up to AK, right? you have a point A1, A2, up to AK, uh, you can use this guy to describe your, your set. And how can you describe it? You can say that, oh, you can describe it by checking whether, oh, is it in, is there something that is in here? Is there something that is in here or not? Is there something that is in here or not? Here or not? Here or not? Here or not? And so on. Is there something that is in here or not? <clears throat> okay. Now what you can do is you have these uh, A1 up to AK, right? And so you have the total of 2k plus one uh, sets here. So the number of, of possible possibilities that you can have is two to the 2k plus one, which is finite. Okay. And now what you can do is uh, you can construct a set. Uh, you can now know that for every 
am satisfied the property is that for every x1 up to xn, you're going to get that uh, phi x1 up to xn y for every, uh, I thought I forgot for all, for all y that is in here. It is in this if and only if it must be one, there must be finitely many k many points x not x z1 up to zk such that you can look at the each combination and you plug it in here for each combination as you can say that it's less than here is equal to here or not it is between a1 and a2 or not it is in uh, equal to a2 or not and so on so you can uh, describe it using a formula that look like this and now since m is elementary equivalent to n then you also have that n must satisfy the same properties which means that it holds for every x that is in b uh, in n in n that's mean it also holds for b right so here you get that uh phi for all y phi b1 up to b n y must be of one of the form and one of that form is of the form of finite union of point and intervals so in this case you can get that n is o minimal this is how we prove it. One way that you can use to prove that n is all minimal. <clears throat> okay, uh, that's uh, something about all minimality that I want to talk about. Actually, there were many interesting things about uh, all minimal structures that we can uh, study, but uh, I would just say that, and uh, let me say that this is just the beginning of the or minimal theory. Okay, uh, I think that's it for my talk today. All right, uh, thank you very much, Atipat. Um, it's been a wonderful uh, five lectures that uh, you have been uh, you have given here. Um, so this is a, the the fifth and the last lecture given by Athipat. I hope uh, for those of you who have been attending and uh, for those of you who are going to be watching the recording, uh, I hope you have uh, benefited from this. Um, yeah, so um, I mean, uh, this is a really interesting subject, you know, uh, model theory. And uh, I hope you will continue to pursue, um, you know, studying and uh, learning about this topic. And I'm sure if you have any question, um, Athipat will be uh, more than happy to uh, to answer your question, if you send here an email, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> right. Maybe I should just write uh, my email here. Yes, your email address. Um, write, um, me, write it down. Maybe. Yeah. You can also. Um, I have a link to your uh, to your uh, website on the uh, association's email. Uh, the the program uh, web page. So uh, yeah, yeah. You can you can send that. Uh, you can show yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But I gonna just put it here. That's true. Yes, 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 Michael. Uh, it will be great. Um, and also, uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, you know, um, because there are some people who are asking about the uh, certificate. So, if you're interested in this topic, uh, you can try to write a couple of pages of an article uh, on the things that you have learned um, in this uh, this series. I mean, uh, lecture by given by Atipat. And then uh, we can uh, issue a certificate if you uh, if you want to. If that's gonna help you in any applications in the future, um, Atipat, can you send? Uh, can you share the your your um, your notes? Oh, yeah, your sure. Notes? Let me yeah. do it right now. Maybe after sure. Uh, you can you know either send to me or you put it on your website. You can send me the link and I can mm -hmm. just uh, link it to your website. Okay. Then yeah. Let me compile my. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sure. Take your time. Don't worry. Yeah. So thank you very much, Atipat. I've also uh, sent you an email yesterday. Um, if you can take a look. <laughs>
mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, that's it for today. Um, so any question you can uh, forward to uh, to uh, Atipat. And um, is there any question? Let me just check. Um, okay, so there is a question. Uh, have there been any lectures on proof theory, which is an area of logic which hasn't been covered in this series? Yes, I was also planning for a, um, a series on uh, proof theory. But unfortunately, uh, I couldn't find anyone who, <laughs> who, uh, who is able to do the proof theory part. Um, but if you're interested, I can uh, I can continue to, to uh, keep this in view, and then I will uh, keep looking for people who might you know want who might be happy to give a uh, a series of lectures on proof theory, and then I will let you know. Okay, Michael. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Uh, thank you, Adipat. Okay, Michael, I will do that, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Okay, hope to see you in the okay. future events, and also uh, you know uh, hopefully in person. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, hello, uh, Akito Tsuboi. Uh, nice to see Hi. you. First time. Hajime <laughs> Nice to see you. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.